My name is Wendy Cromash. I am on the board of the Levy Senior Center Foundation. And the Levy Senior Center Foundation is the sponsor for these great lectures. Without them, we would not be able to bring them to you. Uh, today, we have a very special presentation. Our favorite astro educator, Michelle Nichols, is going to take us on an armchair tour of the universe. We will save, uh, save questions till the end. You're welcome to send them uh, through in the Q&A and we'll get to them when the presentation concludes. Michelle, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Wendy. And um, just, to, just a, a quick technical thing, Wendy, when I start sharing my screen, just so you know, the video is the video that I see in Zoom is going to go behind my PowerPoint. So if something happens and I don't notice, just jump in on the audio and let me know. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to keep talking until you tell me to stop. <laughs> so um, uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, my name is Michelle Nichols, and I am the Director of Public Observing at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. Uh, and I saw a question in the Q&A about uh, asking when the planetarium will reopen. As you know, we have been closed to the public since March of last year. We are currently still close to the public. We have not announced a reopening date. Um, we are taking a look at all of the safety considerations and uh, trends in terms of uh, visitation to museums and movie theaters and that sort of thing. And when we would be likely to see a normal, quote, quote, uh, normal visitation pattern for us. So short version is I don't have any news to share with you about uh, reopening for the Adler. In the meantime, you get me uh, on, on uh, this program here. So I hope I'm a suitable substitute until um, you can visit us in person sometime, hopefully in the very near future. Anyway, thanks for coming, everyone. As Wendy said, this is an armchair tour of the universe. Now, what that will mean is I'm going to show you some really awesome pictures of stuff that is outside of our own solar system. I'm going to go over um, what I mean by some of these terms because universe, solar system, galaxy, what is all that? I'll, I'll mention all that in just a sec. Um, uh, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A. As Wendy said, we will get to the questions at the end. I know you guys are not shy about asking questions. So we'll save them all till the end so we can just dive in at that point and we'll get through as many as we possibly can. Um, and otherwise, uh, one thing I like to tell folks, especially with this talk, um, is I am not here to turn you into walking, talking astronomers. If, if I am giving you too much information, just let it all wash over. Enjoy the pictures because a lot of them are pretty stunning. Um, and a lot of them are from the Hubble Space Telescope. So I hope you enjoy those. My goal with this talk is, is not to just throw facts at you and hope that you remember all of them. I don't care if you remember one of them. Um, what I want to do though, is inspire you the next time you see a news story about something related to astronomy, or you want to go on to the Hubble Space Telescope website or something like that. Um, that, that, that might inspire you to want to do that in the future. That's all my goal is for this talk. Just let it all wash over. If you happen to remember something at the end, great. If not, it's okay. Um, and uh, I hope that you can um, uh, get some inspiration for uh, wanting to learn more. So let's go, let's dive in. All right. All right. When you look out on a starry sky, um, maybe you're out where it's dark. Maybe you can actually see a sky that looks something like this. We, we might have trouble seeing even 5%, 2% of the stars that are in this picture, but um, you may wonder to yourself, what is all that stuff? What, what am I looking at? Um, you can you can see there are some some dots on here that are different colors. You can see there are some um, there's there seems to be a faint hint of maybe some some greater concentration of stars here in the in the middle. 
Um, but you can see this, this object right here is kind of an orange color. And this object over here is kind of a blue white color. This one is sort of a yellowish color, another orange one over here, some more orange ones. What are we looking at? We're looking at stars. I want to talk about what makes a star different from other things. Um, a star makes its own energy. And simple as that. A star makes its own energy. A planet orbits a star. Um, some stars have no planets. Some stars have several. Um, our sun has several. And planets can be different sizes. They can orbit their stars a little closer, a little farther. Um, but planets reflect light from their stars. There are also other objects that go around planets. We call those satellites, and, or you can use the word moon. Um, there are rocky objects in our solar system. We call those asteroids. There are icy objects in our solar system. We call those comets. So a solar system refers to a star, maybe more than one, and the system of stuff that goes along with those stars. Our solar system consists of one star and several planets, hundreds of moons, thousands of comets, hundreds of thousands of asteroids. It's basically lots of stuff, right? So when you look out at this particular starry scene, you're looking at each individual star that's here and each of these stars could have planets. Now, what isn't apparent from a picture like this is how far away are these things? Well, here I've got, actually I'll go back. This group of stars right here is called the constellation Orion. Here's his little head, his little dim head. There's, there's uh, his shoulder here. That star is called Betelgeuse. There's this shoulder star here. This is called Bellatrix. Um, this uh, is his belt and his sword and a pinkish colored thing right there, which I'll get to that in a second. This uh, star right here is called Safe. And this star here is called Rigel. And so this is a, a pretty popular constellation to look at because um, the stars are fairly bright. You can even see them from downtown Chicago. Now, again, what isn't readily apparent is how far away are these stars? They look like they're all two-dimensional, but they really are three-dimensional. Here's that same group right here. Here's Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, the three stars of his belt, this fuzzy pink thing right here. Safe and Rigel. So here's that same shape. But if you take a look at how far away these stars are, they're basically all at different distances. That isn't readily apparent unless you start actually studying where these stars are. Now I mentioned that that last picture had uh, what kind of suggested a, a concentration of stars, maybe some more stars some dimmer stars off in the distance. If you go out under a really, really, really dark sky and you take a, a, a longer exposure picture with a camera, you start to see this band of stars across the sky. It's called the Milky Way, the Via Lactea. Um, basically, one story is it spilled milk up there in the sky. Um, so hence the name Milky Way. And yes, the name of the, of the object, the name of the, the, the feature in the sky came first, the name of the candy bar came second. Um, so the, the Milky Way, you can see part of it here. Maybe there's a suggestion that this part over here might be a little thicker than this part over here, maybe a little wider here. Well, this is only part of it. Let's take a panoramic view of the Milky Way. And this picture is taken from the Southern Hemisphere. This is from one of the large telescope complexes in South America. And again, it's a panoramic image. The, the, the Milky Way isn't going to look this curved, per se, in the sky. Um, this is a, a wide image uh, stretched out over a flat screen. And so you can see, though, that band is even bigger and some fuzzy things over here. And there's a, there's a city off in the, off in the distance. So the Milky Way is this band of stars across the sky. Now I mentioned the word galaxy. Our solar system, again, one star, planets, moons, comets, asteroids, all the stuff. We are part of the Milky Way galaxy. A galaxy is a collection of stars. It could be a small collection of a few tens of thousands of stars. It could be a humongous collection of 
literally trillions of stars. And we live within a collection of stars that's somewhere around 400 billion with a B stars. Now, if you want to see what a drawing of our galaxy looks like, this is the, the latest and greatest. This is a, a sense of what our galaxy looks like. Our, our sun is off here in, in one of these uh, protrusions here. This is called a spiral galaxy, meaning it looks like a big pinwheel. Now we're not in the middle, we're, we're off to one side. We're within one of these spiral shapes right here. But how in the world do we know what our galaxy looks like? If we're on the inside, if you're looking at this picture, this gives you absolutely no suggestion whatsoever as to what the shape of our galaxy is. It just looks like a big flat pancake in the sky. What do, how do we know what the pancake actually looks like? Well, that was a puzzle for astronomers for literally a couple hundred years at least. Uh, once, once we realized we, we live with, with a lot of stars out there in the sky, what is this shape? How do we know? Well, one way you could try to figure it out is find some big things out there, find some big stuff and map out where those big things are. Maybe the big things will help trace what the shape of the Milky Way galaxy is. And that's what they've done in this particular image. What they are drawing, I should say, what we've done is we have mapped out big giant clouds of gas out there in space. The gas is mostly hydrogen. Um, that's what most of the stuff you can see in the universe uh, is made of. It's mostly hydrogen, most abundant stuff in the whole universe. And if you trace out where those big gas clouds are, you start to get a sense of the shape of our galaxy. And then what we can do is we can look to see, okay, we've got a pinwheel shape here. Can we see other pinwheels out there elsewhere that kind of look like ours? And the answer is yes, yes, we can. So that's how we know what our galaxy looks like. And then finally, we've got the universe. The universe is just the collection of everything we can see. And so I'm going to take you on a trip from the starry sky in our backyard, outside of our solar system, out through the Milky Way, and out into the rest of the universe. So here we go. Now this is a picture of that same constellation Orion, but this is probably a lot more colorful than what you're used to seeing. There's a lot of stuff out there that even just your eyes under a really dark sky aren't gonna show. Cameras can show us so much more about what's out there and what things are really like. And not only that, we can use different types of light that our eyes can't see in order to learn even more. But take a look, here's Betelgeuse, here's Bellatrix, here's the belt, here's the fuzzy pink thing, here is safe, here is Rigel, but look at all the pink stuff, all the dark stuff. The dark stuff is dust. The pink stuff is hydrogen, mostly. Um, and so, wow, there's a lot of gas and dust and stuff out there. Space is mostly empty, but not totally. So we can start to see there are these collections of where this pink stuff, this hydrogen gas resides. Now let's take a closer look at this pink thing right here. So when we first started really studying the sky and trying to figure out what stuff was, especially when we pointed our telescopes out at things in the sky, astronomers started finding a bunch of fuzzy stuff. And so of course, being scientists, we're going to name things and we are going to probably name something based on what it looks like not what it actually is, because we're going to see it first, and then later we'll figure out what it is. Well, we saw a lot of fuzzy stuff. The Latin word, because we use a lot of Latin in science, Latin and Greek, the Latin word for fuzzy thing in the sky is a cloud, and the Latin for word for cloud is nebula. So you'll hear of a lot of things called nebula out there in space. It just refers to fuzzy thing that we saw with our telescopes. This fuzzy pink thing. This is a nebula here. I'll talk about that in a second. Here's another one here. Here's another one here. Here's another one here. This You can't really see it in here. I don't have a close-up image in this talk, but this 
fuzzy thing right here, that's called the horsehead nebula. It's the fuzzy thing in, in this direction that kind of looks like it's in the shape of a horse head. You can't really see it, don't worry. Um, this thing right here is called the Orion Nebula. It's the fuzzy thing in the direction of the constellation Orion. So that is the Orion Nebula close up. Um, and it's absolutely amazing. It's, it's basically this cloud of dust and hydrogen gas that's being lit up by really bright stars that are within it. Um, we can take a closer up view of, of this nebula, which I'll do in a little bit, but we'll come back to this one. I want to show you other nebulae, that's the plural of nebula. Why am I showing you these? Because this is how stars form. This is how solar systems form. Stars form in big giant gas clouds. Solar systems form around stars. And so you need big giant gas clouds to be able to form stars, but they don't all look like this. Here's another one. This one's really pretty. Um, and so you get these sculpted shapes and, and different uh, uh, materials and things. By the way, I get asked a lot, do these things really look like this to your eye? And the answer is not really because our eyes, human eyes are not the greatest light detectors out there. I should say they're not the great, greatest color detectors out there. Our eyes are not very sensitive to red colored light. They just aren't. We're, they're most sensitive to yellow green. Um, so when you see pictures like this, a lot of times they're not in quote unquote what we would call true color. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to bring out certain features. We'll use different colors to represent different things. The structure is real. The shape is real. Sometimes the color is real, but not always. Um, but always the structure is real, the shape is real, period. The color is the thing that may or may not always be the what your eyes would see. Again, limitations of our eyes, but sometimes it's we're, we're bringing out certain information. So we'll assign certain colors to certain things. Here's another one. Um, and you can see this one, you can see the stars that have formed within uh, this big giant gas cloud. Um, really pretty stuff, right? Now this one is probably one of the most famous Hubble Space Telescope images ever. It's called the Eagle Nebula. No, it does not look like an eagle. Um, but this image was released in 1995. And what it is is a big collection of gas and dust. And when we take a, a, a better look at it, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, took another picture of it in 2015. We can add to the rest of it. Well, one of the questions that astronomers like to ask is, hey, what about that stuff I can't see? Is there anything in that dusty stuff? What's inside there? Well, when you take a look using light that our eyes can see, I don't know, you, take, you, you can see this picture as well as I can, can't really tell what's inside there. I see dusty stuff, but I don't know what else is in there. So I need to use some other form of information to tell me what's inside the dust, because obviously light that my eyes can see isn't telling me what's in there. So one of the main features of the Hubble Space Telescope is it can not only show you light that your eyes can see, it can see a little bit of light that our eyes can't see. And one of the types of light that our eyes can't see is called infrared. You may know one form of infrared as heat. Well, there, if, if there's something inside that dust, it's presumably going to heat up the dust. Maybe I can see that. Maybe I can see within that, get that dust cloud using infrared light, and surely I can. This is the exact same picture, but using light that our eyes cannot see. I'm going to toggle back and forth. I'll do it a little slowly because I know sometimes it'll It'll mess up on Zoom. Um, but take a look at this star right here. See, it's lined up, right? So I'll go back. See this star right here? It's lined up. These are all lined up. All these stars are there. I didn't fake it out. I didn't say, well, this is what we think is inside this dust cloud. No, this really is what's there. It's that there's so much dust, you don't even realize how much is there until you can use a type of light that our eyes can't see. Suddenly, the universe opens up and we get even more information. 
than than what just our eyes can show us and just what our tel what our uh, simple telescopes can show us. Well, I'm going to go back to the Orion Nebula, the fuzzy thing in the direction of the constellation Orion. And we can actually use the Hubble Space Telescope and others to show us what's around some of the stars. We can take a close up view um, of, of what is around some of those stars. And when we do, we see stars and we see this dusty stuff around them. Planets form in the dusty disks around stars. Um, and so we see that actually happening in the Orion Nebula. The planets probably aren't there yet. It, it, it may just be the dusty stuff, but in a few tens or hundreds of millions of years, there may be planets around these stars. But we can see the very early stages of planets forming. And when we start to look around at stars outside of our own solar system, we start to notice, wow, there are a lot of planets out there. With, with just the stars we've been able to, to uh, study, it, it appears as though there are planets around most stars that are out there in the Milky Way. There, could, there are 400 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy. The number of planets is probably in the trillions. Now, how many of those planets have we found? Nowhere near trillions. Uh, we will probably never to get to, tr to trillions. But I, I took this screenshot from this particular website this morning. And it's exoplanets.nasa.gov. And one thing I just realized is I'm not sure if this is HTTP or HTTPS. Um, I apologize for that. I just realized I, I didn't check that. But anyway, the important part is exoplanets nasa.gov exoplanet just refers to planet that goes around a star that is not our sun how many have we found as of the last update which was today june 1st 2021 we have found 4389 planets orbiting 3260 stars some of them have one planet some have many one has as many as seven and there are almost 6,000 others that they need to follow up on to see if those actually are, are uh, confirmed sightings. Not all of them will be, but um, this number is gonna go up by probably several thousand over the next few years as we, as we uh, add some from this candidate column and put it into the confirmed column. So what does it boil down to? We found a lot of planets. Um, and we found a lot of planets just in the last about 25 years. We found the first one, uh, October 6th, 1995. Oh, I just realized day after my birthday, 1995. Um, I had just started working at the Adler uh, in, in June of 1995. So it's coming up on 26 years um, in about two weeks for me. But anyway, that planet that was found, um, is, is bigger than the planet Jupiter. And about 20 years later, we've been able to reduce the size of the planets we've been able to find to planets that are more like the size of our Earth. That's a big leap, um, a big leap in capability. A, we can find planets. B, we can find planets and figure out what size they are. C, we can find planets and figure out if they have air. How in the world do we do that? Well, the way we find a lot of these planets is, and actually I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second because I think this shows up better if you are looking at me and not the screen. So I'll go back to sharing in just a sec. But the way we find these planets is, let's pretend that my head is a distant star. You are the earth and you're looking through a telescope at a star and my head is that distant star. If there is a planet that passes between you and that star, that planet is gonna dim the light from the star. It's gonna block some of the light from the star. So if you study the light from the star, it's gonna dip. And then as the planet moves away, it's gonna go back to its normal brightness. So you can figure out, hey, there might be a planet there. If that dip happens again, hey, you've just figured out what the planet's year is. And if you do it again and again, you can go, yep, there's definitely a planet there. If you can then figure out what the planet's year is and you figure out how much light it blocks, you figured out the size of the planet. 
uh, you can figure out how far it is from the star. Again, you can figure out the size. If it has, if there's a way, you may also be able to figure out what type of planet it is. I'll get to that in a second. But um, how do we figure out if these planets have air? Well, if the light, if the if the planet passes between you and the star, the light from the star passes through the atmosphere next to the planet. You study the light from the star. You study the light passing right near the planet. If the light's the same, no air. If the light's different, if, if the light is telling you that this, this stuff that the light is passing through is different from the star stuff, now you've figured out there's air there. And you can figure out, in some cases, what the air is made of. Pretty cool, right? Amazing that we've, we've come this far in about 25 years. There's a planet that we not only, A, have figured out how big it is, B, we figured out what its year is. C, we figured out it's bigger than the planet Jupiter. D, we've made a map of the clouds. Now we're not gonna get a cloud map like you look outside right now and you see some puffy clouds in the sky. It's not that good of a cloud map, but it's, it's at least knowing where in general that the clouds are around that planet. By the way, this only works for the really closest stuff. <laughs> the farther away one of these planets is, it's really hard to do this. How about this planet? Um, that comes up when I say this, there we go. There's a planet out there that has a big gigantic ring system. How did we know that? Well, as the planet passes in front of a star, well, you would expect the light from the planet to block the light from the star, but before it even got there, the light started flickering. And then it got blocked out a little bit and then it flickered some more. You that what you were seeing was the rings the light passing through the rings, then getting blocked by the planet, then passing through the rings again as the planet moved off to the side. So there's a planet out there with a ring system larger than Saturn's ring system, 200 times larger. That's quite a ring system. How about this planet? Uh, the name of the planet is WASP-79b. WASP refers to the telescope array that, that uh, took this information. Um, the forecast on this planet, uh, if you think Chicago's weather is terrible, how about this one? 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, steamy humidity, scattered clouds, yellow skies, and rain made of iron. If you think Chicago's weather is bad, just, uh, just imagine this planet. How about this one? This one, I, I, I just learned this term recently. This is a special and rare class of planets that we found. And you got to admire whoever the scientist was who came up with this term. It's called a super puff. Um, it's a nickname for a, a class of planet. It basically has the density of cotton candy. Next time you see cotton candy, go to a fair, get some cotton candy, eat some cotton candy. That cotton candy is about the same density as this planet. Um, Basically, this planet is really, really young. Its atmosphere is really, really thin. Um, and so overall, it has the density of cotton candy. It is not made of cotton candy. That'd be a neat trick. Um, but it has the density of cotton candy overall. Um, so anyway, this is a, a cool type of planet that we found. But we found planets that are bigger than Jupiter, the size of Jupiter, the size of Uranus and Neptune, the size of Earth. We've even found planets down to the size of Mars. Um, and so these are all interesting planets that, uh, that warrant further study. We've even found a planet or a, a star that has seven planets going around it. And notice the size of those seven planets compared to the size of the rocky planets in our solar system, about the same size. This is a really interesting uh, solar system to study. We found, I showed you the picture of the planets or the, the, the disks that are around those stars in the Orion Nebula. Those are extremely young. Um, it'll be a few tens or a few hundred million years before those stars might have planets. So we have found the very young. We have also found the very old. This is a, an artist's rendition. And by the way, all of these 
images, quote unquote, of planets that I'm showing you, uh, of planets around other stars, all of them are artist renditions. We do not have direct images of the surfaces of these planets. They're just too far away. Um, but we've got a, a planet system or a star system called TOI561. This star is 11 billion years old. It has at least three planets. The planets need to be then about 11 billion years old. This shows because planets form at about the same time the stars do. You can't have a star necessarily and then up oh, planets form oh, a few billion years later. That really just doesn't happen. Um, so they form at about the same time. That means these planets are about 11 billion years old. It means our universe has been forming planets for a really long time. So makes you think about what's out there in the universe. All right, so I've showed you uh, stars, how they form. Uh, they, they may form with planets around them. Stars live their lives, and then what? Well, this is uh, another one of those nebulae. This is called uh, the Carina Nebula. It's visible in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and uh, it's the fuzzy thing in the direction of the constellation Carina. And if we look up close at one of the stars, so over here in this nebula, we get this. This star is probably two stars. You, pro you can't see them. They're within these two lobes of stuff. Um, but the, the stars are probably two of them. They're probably orbiting each other. This Eta Carinae star or stars, one of these might explode someday. We call that a supernova. Supernova just means big giant exploding star. So we've seen this happen. So this one could explode someday. What does it look like after a star explodes? What, is, what does that look like? Well, here is a set of images from the aftermath of a big giant star exploding. This is um, a star that exploded in, 19, well, we saw it on Earth in 1987. And when Hubble started looking at it in 1994, we could see there was material in the center glowing really brightly. There is a ring of material around it. In 1998, this material in the center is getting dimmer, but this ring of material is getting brighter and brighter. And then that is dimming out as well. We've seen change over time with this one, but basically, uh, not to get too deeply into the mechanisms going on here, the, the key point to remember is big giant stars explode. And then we can follow up afterwards and see what does this all look like? Well, actually, if you put these uh, images together and watch the change over time, you can actually see these changes happening, which is really cool. So we've seen these changes occurring over the last 35 years. Well, We've only had telescopes for about 400 years and some of these stars exploded longer ago, or a lot longer ago than that. Um, here's another one. Uh, this, this remnant of a star, this is the stuff left over after this star exploded. Uh, it was seen on earth about 340 years ago. Um, so just wanted to show you that you can get some, some different shapes, uh, the older that you get with these with these uh, objects. This one is called the Crab Nebula. The, this star explosion we think was seen on Earth about a thousand years ago uh, in the year 1054. And what's cool is we've been watching it for long enough with telescopes that you can actually put several of these images together. I hope this is showing up okay on your end. It's a quick transition um, and I know sometimes the uh, internet may not be showing up very well. I hope you're able to see this. But what I can see on my end is the, um, the Crab Nebula is expanding. And we can actually see that over time. By the way, no, it does not look like a, a crab. <laughs> Here's another one. Uh, sometime during the third century, 1700 years ago, a star exploded. And if people had been looking up uh, to notice it, they might have seen it, but it was only visible in the southern hemisphere. And at least as of now, we've not found any records that anyone has had recorded it. Probably people saw it, um, but we don't know for certain if anyone actually recorded it. Uh, but it, again, it was visible in the southern hemisphere. All right, just want to show you, you can get different um, results 
out of the same process of, of stars, big giant stars exploding. Now, does this happen to our sun? Is our sun gonna explode? If so, when? Well, the answer is never. Our sun will never explode. It's not a big giant star. It's big compared to us, but it's not big compared to other stars. So our sun will not explode. In about three to five billion years, our sun is going to uh, increase in size and puff off its outer layers into space. Now, I'm, again, I'm not going into the, to the uh, individual mechanisms of what's going on. It's a lot more complicated than that, but suffice it to say, our sun will puff up and puff off. And what it will look like is something akin to this. This is called the cat's eye nebula. Um, again, this is another case of the word nebula just being used to say fuzzy thing. And it's a lot of different things that we use with the word nebula. It could refer to what's left over after a star explodes. It could be the cloud of gas and dust where stars form. It could be the, the puffed off stuff from a star like our sun. It's all nebula, it's all fuzzy, but the processes are all different. And no, we, we didn't go back and change the name. We do that in astronomy, we like confusing you. Um, so anyway, the cat's eye nebula is what's left over after this star puffed off its outer layers into space, leaving the center of the star behind. That's what that is in the middle. Here's another one. Same process, different shape. So this is, again, potentially what our sun might look like in another three to five-ish billion with a B years. All right. So we've talked about solar systems, planets, how stars form, how stars die. Now let's go beyond our Milky Way galaxy. You can find all this stuff in other galaxies, other collections of stars. But now I want to show you the galaxies themselves. What do these things look like? So we're going to go beyond the Milky Way. Now I showed you this drawing again. So this is approximately what our galaxy looks like. Again, we're not in the middle. Um, it's, it's a collection of about 400 billion stars. This looks like a star, a single thing in the middle, but actually we're just so far away from the middle, it just gets fuzzed out into looking like one thing, but it actually, this is literally tens of billions of stars uh, in the middle. And then many, many, many more billions tracing out those spiral arms. What's nearby? We have other galaxies near us and we have a large one nearby called the Andromeda Galaxy. It used to be called the Andromeda Nebula. Again, it was fuzzy, so we called it a nebula and then figured out what it is. And so that one got its name changed to Andromeda Galaxy. There are others, the Triangulum Galaxy and a few other small ones. Not all, not all the galaxies have cute names like Andromeda. Some just have letters and numbers, um, but We'll come back to Milky Way and Andromeda in, uh, in a bit. So I'll, I'll point out why I'm, I'm bringing those up. But those are the two main ones nearby. This is given the, the wonderful term, the local group. You think with our creativity, we could have come up with a better name than that. But this is the local group of galaxies. Now, there are different kinds of galaxies. They're all made of stars and stuff. But you can have different shapes. Milky Way is spiral. Andromeda is spiral. Triangulum, I think I've got a triangulum picture. Uh, it is spiral as well. But there, there's another kind called elliptical. Elliptical just means round or bubble shaped. And you're just so far away from the stars that are in this galaxy, they just look all fuzzed out. You're, you're looking at literally hundreds of billions of stars in this picture. But you can't see the individual stars. You just see the collective glow from all those stars. Again, this is not one thing in the middle. This is lots and lots and lots of stars in the middle. You're just backed away far enough that it looks, it just looks like they all just kind of run together. Here's another one. And by the way, do you see all the stuff around it? If you're looking at a small screen, I don't know if you can zoom in at all, but um, uh, what I can see is lots and lots and lots of fuzzy things around this galaxy here. Every single one of these fuzzy things is another galaxy. 
This is the main one right here. All these other things, these are all galaxies. Some are small and close, some are big and far. Um, and so they all look like they're different sizes, but they all have these spiral shapes, these round shapes. Here's another set. Again, every single fuzzy thing in this picture is another galaxy. Sometimes they have no shape. This is an irregular galaxy, no shape at all. Um, a lot of these irregular ones are small ones. Um, not always, but a lot of them are. Here's another one. And what did we learn the pink stuff is? Hydrogen, right? And then you can see individual stars or, or groups of stars in this galaxy here. Here's another one. Now those spirals. This is a spiral galaxy called the Whirlpool Galaxy. Um, this is one of the few things in astronomy that actually looks like what it's named for. Um, here's another one. Pretty cool. Here's another one. You can have different shapes of spirals. Some of these look uh, squished. Some of them look like this. What you're actually seeing is sometimes you're not seeing them face on, like we see this, you're seeing them more edge on. So we have different shapes, but we have different orientations for these galaxies as well. They're not all facing us the same way. And this next one is almost edge on. This is called the sombrero galaxy. No, it really doesn't look like a sombrero, but uh, you can, you can kind of use your imagination for that. Then at some point a few decades ago, we saw a galaxy that looked like this over here on the left. And it was given the name the Antenna Galaxy. And then when we pointed the Hubble Space Telescope at it, this green outline stair step shape is this picture here on the right. What you're seeing is galaxies colliding, galaxies in the process of interacting with each other. And so we were able to, to actually resolve the two individual galaxies. These were probably two spirals at one point that are in the process of colliding. So yes, when we say the universe is expanding, yes it is, but you can have individual motions of galaxies. And if they're close enough together, they're gonna run into each other. That's what's happening here. Here's another one. This one looks like a normal galaxy, looks like a normal spiral. But when you think of, say, a fried egg and you got the yolk in the middle, the yolk is off to one side for this one. This looks a bit lopsided. And that's because there's another galaxy off the top of the edge of the picture that you can't see that is kind of pulling on the shape of this one. And it's making it more distorted and, and lopsided. These guys, they're called the mice. Again, they're in the process of colliding. They're in, they're both crashing together and being yanked apart. Um, here's another one. Again, these things get close enough to each other, the gravity of all the stars and dust and stuff, it's just gonna start to yank those shapes apart. And they continue to collide, they continue to interact. There's two more. And then when we look around the universe, we go, wow, we see this a lot. We see these, these collisions happen a lot. Here's 12 more examples. I'm not going to go into all 12, but you get the idea. These collisions actually can happen if these galaxies get close enough. What happens when you've got two spirals that come together? What happens at the end? You get one elliptical, one round-shaped galaxy. You also get some irregular shapes at times. That's this one right here. Now, why did I point out Milky Way and Andromeda earlier? Well, that's because Milky Way and Andromeda are in the process of colliding in about 4 billion years. It'll likely be a little bit more of a glancing blow. We, we first thought it was going to be more of a head-on collision, but the two galaxies are approaching each other um, currently. Uh, and in about 
three to four billion years, they are going to uh, take a glancing blow to each other. And it will very likely distort the shapes of both of them. So we're watching a computer simulation of all of this. And so we see this happening around the sky. So this is pretty normal. And you're probably wondering, oh my goodness, what in the world is going to happen to everything in the galaxy? You're going to have lots of stuff running into other stuff. Believe it or not, no, you won't. Um, space is quite empty. And stars, individual stars, won't collide. Uh, maybe you'll have two stars collide out of the probably trillion that are in this set. You might have two that might come together. What will collide is big giant gas clouds. So what you'll end up with is an elliptical galaxy. And when we look around the universe, we see lots and lots of different galaxies, round ones, spiral ones, irregular shaped ones. And I wanted to bring up this particular site. This is to remind me to switch over the view. So give me just a second. I need to switch over the view to this particular uh, website. So give me a sec. I need to grab the web address and go to my browser and then bring this up so that I can share this particular image with you. Give me a second. Whoops. It helps if I actually hit copy and not non copy. There we go. Okay, so let me go back to Zoom. And let me go back to sharing my screen. Okay, so this is that picture that I was showing you. The reason I want to show you this is you can you actually can go on the Hubble Space Telescope website and interact with a lot of these pictures and you can zoom in on the high resolution ones. You can zoom in. I'm zooming in on just all the stuff that's in this picture. Every single thing you see, every fuzzy thing is a galaxy, every single one. And it's just amazing to see all this stuff. Oops, sorry. And I just wanted to point this out that your tax dollars have largely uh, paid for the Hubble Space Telescope website. And so you can go on that website and interact with a lot of these images. I've, I've shown you nothing that isn't publicly available. So anyway, I just want to point that out. It's really cool to, to not only look at these pictures, but zoom in. The resolution is really, really good. Um, and what's kind of amazing is you can see similar images uh, from telescopes. The backyard telescopes can take similar images. Um, but the key is the Hubble Space Telescope has resolution. You actually can zoom in. You can, or at least you can make the image bigger and still see detail you're not really zooming in. You're not getting any closer to that image. What you're doing is you've got so much detail, so much information in that picture that you can expand the picture and still see detail. All right, let me go back to the PowerPoint. We're almost done with the PowerPoint part and then we will go to questions which I know are in the Q&A. Um, all right, again, every fuzzy thing you see in this picture is a galaxy. The dark circles are, they've blotted out the brighter stars in the picture, that's all. Um, and uh, individual stars, those are stars in our own Milky Way. You have to look past them in order to see the, uh, the, the galaxies beyond. Think of them like spots on a window. You have to look past the spots on the window to see the stuff in your backyard. Then in this case, you have to look past the stars in our own Milky Way to see the stuff beyond. Here's another one. Again, everything in this picture is another galaxy. People ask me a lot, do I think there's life out there in the universe? And I say, do the math. 
I mean, if there's what, a hundred billion or more stars in every single one of these galaxies on average, and there are trillions of planets in each galaxy, potentially, billions to trillions, there's gotta be something else out there. Do I think that that stuff has visited here? No, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I'd like to think there is something else out there. And the final uh, uh, set of things I wanna show you is um, people ask a lot about black holes. Uh, black holes are these exotic things. Uh, basically every galaxy seems to have a giant one in the middle. And the, the key is to try to figure out how they form. We don't really know for certain how those big giant black holes form. Um, but a black hole is basically, is not black nor is it a hole, but it's a terrible name. Um, but it is basically a lot of mass in a small space. Imagine the amount of mass the amount of stuff, I mean, you can see our sun is out there today, all right? Take the amount of stuff in one of our suns, one of our stars, and multiply it by six billion and squish that amount of stuff into a ball uh, about the size of our solar system. That's a black hole. That's a big giant black hole. Lots of mass, small space, really high gravity. Um, in the center of this galaxy right here, this is called M87. Um, it's a round galaxy. Uh, we've been able to actually image the black hole itself and, and the, well, the area right around it. And what you've got is, this is not the black hole, it's actually uh, interior to this, but you've got the material that is orbiting the black hole. It is coming at you. I believe it is, it is rotating clockwise. Yes, it is rotating clockwise. It is rotating this way and the disk of material is coming at you and moving away from you. And so this is material right around the black hole at the center of this galaxy. Um, these black holes are incredibly exotic, but this is the first time we've been able to image the material orbiting the black hole to this level of detail. Um, our, our own Milky Way galaxy also has a black hole like this at the center. Uh, so we hope there will be an image like this of our own Milky Way black hole at some point in the next few years. So I, I couldn't do a universe talk without saying something about black holes. Um, you can get different sizes. They can form in different ways. Um, but the, the main thing to remember about a black hole, lots of mass, small space, high gravity, basically it. And everything about that Disney black hole movie is pretty much wrong. Um, other than that, <laughs> they're pretty cool. And everybody has heard of them, but nobody knows what they are. So anyway, um, all right. Wendy, you ready for questions? I am. That was all fascinating. Right. So Thank interesting. Uh, so the first question up is, why are planets round? Ah, excellent question. OK, why are planets round? Planets are round because of gravity. If you have enough mass you'll then have enough gravity to pull something into a round shape. You can ask the same question of asteroids. Why are most asteroids not round? Why are most moons not round? Because they don't have enough mass and therefore enough gravity to pull them into a round shape. So uh, there's one asteroid that has enough mass and it's called Ceres, C-E-R-E-S. It is the only round asteroid. Comets nowhere near enough mass to pull them into a round shape. So comets are not round at all. Um, planets are round. There are some moons that are round. Our moon is round, um, but it has enough mass to pull it into a round shape. And what shape are galaxies? Galaxies um, can be spiral shaped, elliptical shaped, um, or irregular, no shape. So but galaxies are made of individual objects, individual stars. So you can have a, a mishmash of shapes with that. Um, when you're talking about something being round, it is an individual object that then has enough mass to pull it into a round shape. Okay. What causes the spiral shapes to form? Oh, oh gosh. That is... Uh, 
I'll say the term gravity wave, but that won't make any sense to anyone. Um, basically, uh, the easiest way I can describe the shape is um, think of a traffic jam where you have when you look at a traffic jam from a helicopter and you can see there is this line of, of jammed up cars and you can tell there's there's cars coming in and there's cars coming out but the but the traffic jam itself stays in the same place if you have the same amount of cars coming in as going out and you've got this jam it's not going anywhere but the individual objects will move through it so you've got this um conglomeration of material you've got these stars that that bunch up the wave of gravity will will continue to move the stars the individual stars will move within and without the or move into and out of the spiral shape um but the shape remains that's the best way I can describe it. That's not my uh, explaining how spirals get their shape is not my strong suit. That's the best way I can describe it is think of a traffic jam. And it's just a jammed up, those spiral arms are just where the material is jammed up a little more than, than the material in between. Now what actually, what actually starts the spiral shape, that I don't know. I know there's an answer, I just don't know what it is. Okay. Is there sound in the galaxies? Can you hear yeah. noise? Um, to our human ears, no, because we can only hear down to a certain low level threshold. Um, anything below that frequency, we can't hear. Um, all sound is, is an energy wave moving through material. And so what you have, what you need is, at least in, in our case, our everyday case, you're hearing me because my voice, my, my, my uh, uh, voice box is vibrating air at different frequencies and making the different, and I'm making the different sounds. That energy is propagating out to the microphone. The microphone is converting that to electrical signal. The electrical signal is converted on your end and sent off to the ether, uh, converted on your end. And it's uh, vibrating a, a speaker on, on your end which is vibrating air molecules that your eardrum can then hear. So sound is vibrating uh, energy moving through air, but it could be energy moving through water. Have you ever heard sound underwater? You're not hearing air, you're hearing energy moving through water. Uh, sound can vibrate through, through railroad rails, like steel, whatever. Sound can, needs, needs a medium to move through. As long as you have material, out there in the universe that is dense enough, then a sound wave could go through it. It just you just need this molecule to hit this one, which then transfers the energy then to this one, which then transfers the energy to this one. Eventually, it could get to your ear. If that happens at a high enough rate, you can hear it. If it happens at a too low of a rate, you're not going to hear it. But it's still a sound. So it's it's uh, calculable, but probably not detectable. <laughs> so anyway, short answer, yes, but your ears, it's a limitation of our ears. They're only gonna hear to a certain threshold because this is the environment that our ears are geared toward. Our ears are not geared toward the environment of space. Okay, um, will the collision of the Milky Way and, and Andromeda affect life on Earth? This will be in about 4 billion years. Assuming and there still is life on it. Exactly. And so, uh, but our, our sun is going to start expanding in about 3 to 5 billion years. So we will be affected much more by the expansion of our sun than the collision of Milky Way and Andromeda. So that in and of itself in about a billion years, the surface of the earth will be uninhabitable to humans um, because it will already heat up enough that it'll boil away the oceans. So um, is, is this ahead. because of the sun expanding or because of global warming? 
No, because of the sun expanding. The <laughs> sun heating up and expanding, this is not due to global warming. We may accomplish all that in 100 years <laughs> or 50 years. We may do that all by ourselves. Um, but uh, no, this is totally separate from climate change. Yeah. And you just said the oceans will be boiling? Mm-hmm. Uh, not, not, I'm not talking climate change. No, no, I, I know. No, no. I no. just. Yep. But don't what? worry. We Humans will oh, be off is... exploring the universe by then. We'll be fine. I'm not worrying. Believe me. Uh, using the definition of a planet, what is it that caused Pluto to be declassified? <laughs> Politics. Um, <laughs> um, a, those are two separate questions. Um, what is the definition of a planet and why was Pluto declassified? Two separate questions. Definition of a planet, according to a group of scientists known as the International Astronomical Union, which does not represent all astronomers on this planet. It's only about 10,000 of them. A planet is round. It orbits the sun. It has enough mass and therefore enough gravity to, to uh, basically be gravitational master of its orbit. Basically, it can clear out its orbit of other stuff. Pluto, according to, okay, by the way, if you're confused by that third part, don't worry, everybody else is too. Pluto, by that planet definition, it meets the first part, it's round. Second part, it orbits the sun. Third part, it does not have enough mass and therefore enough gravity to clear out its orbit of other stuff. One little problem with that definition. It's a terrible definition. Uh, by that definition, if you stuck Earth out where Pluto is, Earth would not have enough mass and therefore enough gravity to clear out its orbit of other stuff if it's that far out. Earth would not be a planet by that definition. That tells me that definition is awful. And so there's a lot of people who know this. There's a lot of people who do not use that definition. Um, it is, again, a definition that was put together by a group of scientists um, uh, about 15 years ago. And they did it at the end of their conference. Most people had already left by then. It was up for a vote, and the people who were there voted for the definition. Um, but there are a lot of scientists out there who go, wait a minute, most of you people who voted, you don't study planets. You study other stuff. Sure, this definition might work for you, but in terms of planets, this doesn't make any sense. Can we come up with some other definition? So. There, there, are, uh, there are a lot of astronomers out there who, who just who still call Pluto a planet. I still call Pluto a planet. Um, it's crazy to me to think that a bunch of astronomers are making political hay out of a poor and, and that's, But that's also something to keep in mind. There's no treaty out there. There's nothing that every country on Earth has signed that says we have to follow what the International Astronomical Union says. Sure, they name stuff. They self-declare that they will name stuff. And they will come up with definitions. Yes, a lot of that is necessary. We do need standardized definitions or else science would be chaos. You need to, to be following certain boundaries. But different people will, or different scientists will, will need different definitions. Um, in, in terms, of, I can give you another, another uh, uh, example. The word metal, M-E-T-A-L, metal. Metal to a chemist means something different than metal to a uh, to a to a, an astronomer who studies stars. Metal to an astronomer who studies stars is anything not hydrogen and helium. Metal is literally everything else on the periodic table. Metal to a chemist is a certain portion of the periodic table, and everybody is totally fine with that. 
You don't have the chemist going, no, our definition is better. No, our definition is better. No, you know, I need this definition and you need that definition and we're cool. I once, <laughs> I once had to try to convince a, a journalist who contacted me a couple of years ago and said, okay, there's been this argument happening online about the different uh, definitions for seasons. There's meteorological seasons. There's astronomical seasons. You may hurt today, June 1st. June 1st is the start of meteorological summer. June, what is it, 20 or 20th or 21st this year is the start of astronomical summer. And they said, no, we've got two people, two groups of people online arguing with each other about which one is right. I'm like, eh, this is a stupid argument. It doesn't matter. The meteorologists need to chunk up the year into uh, periods of time where the weather is similar, where the weather patterns are similar, where the temperature patterns are similar. And that works for our location for June to uh, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February. When you think of it that way, you go, yeah, that makes sense. But you don't have the astronomers going, no, 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 our definition is right. And that refers to it's a solstice season, equinoxes and whatever. It doesn't matter. We have our definition, meteorologists have theirs, and everybody's happy. So it gives me hope that sometime in the future, we will come up with a definition of the word planet, and we'll be okay that if there's more than one. Okay. But right now, but for right now, call Pluto a planet. It's fine. Okay. No one really cares. Uh, what's the oldest object in the universe? What is the oldest object in the universe? The oldest, oh, the oldest object we've discovered or the oldest object that we, um, so, um, it's probably a star. Um, there are definitely some stars out there. That one that I said where they've discovered the, the old, the planets around that really old 11 billion year old star. There are stars out there that are close to the age of the universe, not, not the age of the universe, but close to it, within a billion years or so, billion years or two billion, something like that. And those are probably the oldest objects that we know of, um, those, those oldest stars. Uh, does our spiral galaxy rotate? Yes, it does. And how fast is one rotation? Uh, once every about 200 million years. So put Sorry, I'm laughing. It's just such a, a large quantity. I know. That yeah. It's a it's a long time. Yeah. Our our galaxy has rotated once. And what what was happening 200 million years ago? It was the age of the early dinosaurs, right? I think. I don't know my biology very well, so I, I don't quite know I when that started. So Don't know. Um is every star part of a galaxy? No. There no, that's a good question. There are stars between the galaxies. Um, the key is how many of them, and we don't really know. Um, probably not a lot, or else we'd probably see them. What occupies better. the space between galaxies? Dust, gas, uh, individual stars, okay. and empty um, space. Let's talk about dust. Yes. On Earth, dust is, uh, from what I recall reading, um, skin cells that have been mm -hmm. shed. Mm -hmm. But that's not the kind of dust you're talking about in no, space. No. So it's, can you? Yeah, I knew I knew this question would come up. Um, it would it, dust in space is basically little bits of rock and metal. That's it. Just little little tiny. Think smoke particles, but smoke is uh, uh, from the process of burning something. Not that kind of of smoke. It's uh, smoke sized, smoke particle sized stuff. So when you look at the end, uh, the uh, uh, Orion Nebula, it looks like a really solid thing, right? If you were in it, it would basically be close to the to the best vacuum we could ever make on Earth. These these particles are so far apart, uh, and they're so tiny. Um, but that object is really big, so that's why it looks very solid. But you could easily fly right through it and not hit a thing. Are there but, some? Severe weather, um, is there severe weather, such as windstorms, tornadoes, hurricanes, that kind of thing in space? Um, 
we use the term space weather that refers to material escaping from the sun uh, and energy escaping from the sun and interacting with earth in some way think the northern lights that that is kind of the end result of a of a process of our sun and material and energy from it radiation from it interacting with earth and its magnetic field that's space weather um but it wouldn't be like a thunderstorm kind of thing. There's no rain in space or anything like that. Um, can you have, so no, no hurricanes, um, uh, but these clouds of material that come off the sun do expand outward. They do roll outward. They, they do, or not roll, but they do expand outward. Um, you can have a tornado-esque shape in a dust cloud, if you've got, say, a higher temperature over here and a lower temperature over here, and you've got a differential, a difference in temperature, and you can get a, a dust cloud in between, kind of rotating between that, that warm and cold space. We've kind of seen that. Um, so, but not, not like a, not like a destructive tornado like we think here on Earth. It's, it's, it's a, uh, it's more just differences in temperature and this material kind of making a tornado shape more than anything, I guess. Got it. The closest. Yeah. Uh, there are several questions about the telescope um, behind you to, oh. I believe it's your right. Let me see. I'm going to look at my video. Probably uh, depends the on the one facing one. the mirror. Uh, it looks like on. a mirror. Hang on. Let me go to my video so that I can see what you're seeing. So, okay. So there's that one right there. Yes. Um, that is a solar telescope. So that one is designed specifically just to look at the sun, that gold one, the, oh, sorry, I'll do it right there. Um, so that gold and black one only looks at the sun. Um, it blocks out all the light that comes in except for one specific color of light from the sun. And the sun's the only thing that's bright enough to be able to then be seen by that telescope. So if, if in effect, the sun's the only thing it can see. And then there's uh, that one right there. Actually, let me pull it a little closer. All right. <laughs> That's enormous. <laughs> so there you go, there's that one. See? Wow. See my feet. Yeah. And don't be surprised if you see a cat wandering through. And then, uh, then there's that one right there. Right. So that one and this one are the same size. Um, the main mirror in each of those is six inches across. They're both reflector telescopes, meaning they have a mirror. Um, this design is um, or this this telescope design where the light comes in here uh, if, you, if you take the lid off um, the light the light comes through here bounces off the mirror down at this end comes back up and you put the eyepiece here and you look through here this was designed by Isaac Newton so this is a Newtonian telescope the the mount that it's on. See, it, it goes around and around, and the telescope goes up and down. This was designed um, by a gentleman by the name of John Dobson. So this mount that it sits on, this cradle that it sits on, is called a Dobsonian mount. So a Newtonian reflector telescope on a Dobsonian mount. This telescope here, the light comes through here bounces off the mirror here, comes back up, uh, the mirror's curved. There's a, right where my finger is, behind where my finger is, there's a mirror on the other side of this thing. The light bounces off the mirror, hits, hits the little mirror, and gets shot out through a hole in the, in the main mirror, and you put your eyepiece here in the back of the telescope. Um, this design is called a schmidt cassegrain the and basically it's two different telescope designs in one and um the the cassegrain part of it was designed uh in 1672 um newtonian 1668 the, the golden black one is a refractor 
telescope. So it uses a lens at the front and an eyepiece at the back. Basically, uh, Galileo didn't invent that kind of telescope, but he made it better. Um, so Galileo and Johannes Kepler both um, had a hand in kind of making that kind of telescope. So are these telescopes the kinds of instruments that um, interested parties, people not in the astronaut, astrological community could just order on Amazon or Absolutely. something like that? Yep. Yep. This one, this, this one right behind me here. Um, this one you can pick up for 250, 300 bucks. Um, this one is a lot more expensive because it, it is a tracking telescope. So it has a, a motor um, on it. It has a hand paddle with um, information in it. So kind of like a handheld computer sort of. Um, that telescope you'll pay about $1,300 for. And this one, because it's so specialized, the gold and black one, it's so specialized. Um, you're going to pay about three thousand dollars for that one, but you know, they're all they're all definitely available. Um, and you use the you live in the suburbs. Do you yeah. use them in your backyard? Absolutely. Yeah. These these all belong to the Adler. The the one that you it's I'm going to put my finger right there. You see that one yes. right there? That one in yeah. the back. That's mine. That's my telescope. Oh, so the the silver one. That's silver. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That one I built. So. But the other three belong to the Adler and I brought them home when um, it was evident that we were going to be here a while. Um, I brought the telescopes home thinking we could try some online programs. And so I've been, I take them out every now and then and try to take some pictures or try to play around with them, get to get to know them a little a little better. So yeah, this one you can set up in maybe three minutes. That one takes longer. Um, so there's, there's trade-off. It'll track and do more and show you more. Actually, it'll probably show you the same thing. It's just the tracking part is preferable. Um, but it'll cost more and take longer to set up. Whereas, like I said, this one you can have up and running in three minutes. So. Got it. Uh, was it difficult to build your own telescope? No, tedious. Tedious. Um, because it involves grinding the telescope mirror and shaping it and polishing it. And that took, that took several weeks of, of work. Um, so, And you yeah. did that part yourself? Yeah, um, so the Adler used to have an optical shop on site where um, we actually had an optical shop or some form of that optical shop pretty much right back to the beginning of the Adler. I only learned very recently that that optical shop existed in the 1930s, possibly as early as like 32, maybe even before then, um, but at least back to like 32, 33, somewhere around there. Um, and so I, I built, I, I ground the mirror with the expert assistance of some folks that there may be people in the audience who uh, built mirrors as well. And you may remember Jim Sievers and, and others. Uh, Jim is still around, by the way. Um, not, not at the other, but uh, he, he is still around. I, I conversed with him over email a few months ago. Um, but uh, uh, that part is very tedious because it, you're, you're doing the same repetitive motion over and over and over. And you have to keep checking the shape of the mirror because you're a little bit off. It's going to make your, your picture fuzzy or your image fuzzy. So you have to be really careful um, with- And with was that shop disbanded? It was because when we added on the new wing of the Adler in 1999, when that opened, uh, we had to close the shop because the we needed the space where it was for um, staff area, uh, staff engineering offices, because um, a lot of stuff got shuffled around and moved around because of the new wing. So we needed that space. We hope we can bring back the optical shop in the next few years. That, that's my goal is to try to bring it back in some way. Um, I don't know how, <laughs> I don't know when, uh, but that's my goal. And what kind, of, what kind of profession do the people who work there have? Are they the opticians? Are, are they like opticians the way we would go for our glasses or? Uh, you mean the folks who, who we used to have to, who would in do the, stuff in, in the optical yes. shop specifically? Yes. Um, 
they were, I mean, you can have amateur folks out there who, there are amateur folks out there who have forgotten more than I will ever know about telescopes. Um, and so they, a lot, some folks are just interested in it. Jim, I believe, or I'm almost certain he had a degree in astronomy, I believe. Um, but uh, you don't have to be an astronomer to, to, to learn that information, be able to pass it along to somebody else. You just have to know the process really, really well. Okay. So it could be anybody. Uh, let's see. Uh... Oh, Steve Stibert says, I ground a six inch mirror with Jim in 1980. That's awesome. That's great. And we know that there are those telescopes out there. We know that there are uh, folks out there. Um, so uh, uh, yes, Jim, that's awesome. By the way, uh, Kara, I don't know if Kara or Kara is still on. Uh, love the lecture. Coming to Chicago mid-July. I hope the planetarium will be open by then. Off the record, no. We, we we likely not not to a big degree uh not totally open to the public it won't be it won't be in july i can tell you that um we may have some smaller opportunities possibly like i said we're checking into um but general visitation in july probably not but keep an eye out things could change I, everything i just told you could be 100 wrong in three weeks don't know um uh, cause I'm not the one in charge of making those decisions. So, uh, there's a question about sky writing. Do, do you know what that is? You mean, uh, using a plane to make letters and things in the sky? I, I, I thought it might be a scientific term. If it's just about, if it's just about, um, using an airplane, then I it's don't know. What, what was the question? Can you please explain it? How it oh, happens? Sky writing. I think it, uh, unless that person is referring to a term, a different term, and we're not sure what it is. So if that person no. has a uh, clarification, that would be great. Okay. Um, what's the Big Bang Theory? Oh, dear. Um, something way complicated. Um, but basically what it boils down to is um, how the universe began. It began from a very dense, very hot uh, conglomeration of material that suddenly started expanding. Don't know why it started expanding. Don't know what caused it to, to expand. It just expanded and has been expanding ever since. As it expanded, it cooled off and uh, material condensed. The condensed material that we see is the stars, the dust, the galaxies, the, the everything, everything. Um, but the Big Bang just refers to the, um, the leading theory for how the universe began. And I'm using the word theory, the scientific use of that word. This is not a guess. A theory is a scientific principle that is upheld by multiple lines of evidence, not just well, I think my idea is, my guess is that is not a theory. We throw that word around a lot in everyday life and that's fine. Um, but a guess is not a scientific theory. A scientific theory is, it is not just held up by this observation over here. It's held up by many, many, many times over uh, observations and, and, um, and trying to disprove it. And so far it is the leading explanation for how the universe began. Still a lot of holes as in what exactly caused the universe to start expanding, we don't know. Um, but something did and it was about 13.7 billion years ago. Okay, so the, uh, the skywriting commenter uh, said not plain, sometimes in the sky there are curves in white, not clouds, looks like writing, um, it could be. Uh, airplanes. Mm. Oh, con like airplane contrails. There could be that. Um, there is actually something that we don't really get to see here in at our latitude, but if you go farther north, 
you get to see that they're called noctilucent clouds. They're clouds that form really high up in the atmosphere. Um, and uh, basically the sun has gone down for people on the ground, but up high in the atmosphere, the, it's, there's still sunlight shining. Uh, the sun can still reach those high altitudes and it, it causes these clouds to glow this sort of electric blue color. Um, and so that's something we, we don't get to see it at our latitude. Farther north, they get to see those noctilucent clouds. I really wish I could see some someday because they're supposed to be just absolutely striking. Um, and I bet you those could be certain shapes and things. So, yeah. Have you uh, traveled to uh, see the Aurora Borealis? I have, yes. So um, the first time I saw it was out in the parking lot of my apartment. Uh, my husband and I were living in St. Charles and it was about 20 years ago. And we saw the Aurora from St. Charles. Um, betcha some folks saw that one too. It was this glowing red color in the sky. It was really neat. Um, but the other time was, um, it was about five-ish years ago, uh, I was invited to come to um, uh, Fort Smith, Canada. Um, it's up near, um, it's Alberta, but nearby, I think it's Alberta, it's nearby is Wood Bison National Park, and they hold a Dark Skies Festival there, the local astronomy club does. And so there are about 80 of us in the in the literal middle of nowhere in, in this park. We had to have a satellite phone because <laughs> there was no other way to contact the outside world. And um, the Dark Skies Festival, uh, I wanted to see how dark the skies were in this place with absolutely no light whatsoever. But the northern lights were so bright, I couldn't tell how dark the skies actually <laughs> were. So, yeah. Meaning the, from the Aurora Borealis, yes. you couldn't? I couldn't. I couldn't see the, some of the, a lot of the dimmer stars in the sky because the aurora was that bright. Wow. Yeah. Um. Wow. So interesting. Um, By the way, you can anyone can go up there, and it's not a bad trip to to head to that area. I mean, pandemic excluded. Um, you go to Edmonton first, and you change planes to one of those little puddle skipper planes, and you go up to Fort Smith. It's only about a two hour plane ride from Edmonton to Fort Smith, and you come into this little town, a couple thousand people in this airport, and they are nicer than nice, beyond nice, just incredibly gracious people. And just, I had the most amazing time up there. So the, the local astronomy club does hold this Dark Skies Festival uh, every year in non-pandemic years. So check it out, it's usually in August, and uh, anyone can go, and you can go camp in this area. I was going to say, it was probably off tents, right? It was tents, and then they did have a handful of cabins. But yeah, it was mostly tents, and people drove in their RVs and, and things like that. But yeah, you could totally set up a tent. Um, we just had to have people always kind of on the lookout for, uh, we would call them buffalo, they call them bison. And you had to stay away from them because they are big. And they would just come wandering through <laughs> the camp if you weren't careful. So <laughs> you just had to just keep an eye out for critters, large ones included. So um, this was so interesting. So one uh, question to sort of send us off um, with space movies about outer space. Are there any that you uh, find past muster in terms of because you mentioned something about Disney uh, yeah that black hole movie from 1970 something or other or whatever it was but yeah no yeah not that one <laughs> um, a witch might pass muster astronomically well let's be real none of them are documentaries absolutely so right we can we can suspend disbelief for for different topics um, the Martian is good. Um, especially the technological side of things, good. Definitely some details were fudged in, in that movie, but it's a movie. If it was a if it was more like reality, it'd be more boring probably. Um, 
Although I guess my quibble with that movie is there's some stuff that they could have made more real and it wouldn't have detracted from the movie. So eh, whatever, quibbles. Um, the movie Gravity in terms of a lot of the science is good. Again, quibbles with some stuff. Um, some oh, There's one part at the end that is actually much more dramatic than reality would ever be. Um, but not bad. The movie Interstellar uh, has a simulated black hole sequence. So a sequence to show you what a, what a black hole would look like. So it's a computer simulation of a black hole. It's probably the most advanced computer simulation of a black hole you'll ever see in a movie. Yes, we can quibble about the rest of the movie, but, but that part is, is pretty good. Um, those three, I've, I would say, are they're up there in terms of at least parts of them being pretty good scientifically. But again, they're always going to fudge stuff and make things more dramatic than than they probably normally would, but it's fine. Did you enjoy The Big Bang Theory on TV? Can I make a confession? You've I don't think I've it. ever watched one single episode all the way through of that show. Um, I really like the fact that it made geek cool. And I apparently have been ahead of my time for a long time because apparently I'm cool and I didn't know it. Um, it made science cool. Uh, yes, you're laughing at these folks, but they were on for how long? <laughs> when I, I remember where I was when I first learned about that show. I was, I was at work in, um, in our general office space for the astronomy department. And one of my former colleagues said, you're not going to believe what the what they're trying or the show that I heard that they're trying out this fall. It's called the Big Bang Theory. And here's the premise of it. I'm like, oh, God, that'll never fly. And it was on for a really long time. So but it just wasn't my cup of tea. But that's OK. My brother loves it. <laughs> OK, um, Michelle, this was so wonderful. The Thank you compliments are just pouring in. Um, I know, and you know, you, you alluded to this at the beginning that if not for COVID, we probably would not have been able to have you speak to us, uh, you know, for three different times. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, because I'm working from home, I can rearrange the rest of my day and the rest of my week very, very easily. So being able to come in person is actually kind of hard uh, in the middle of the day, the middle of the week, because I'd have to take time off of work. Um, and it just so happens I'm off this week. So that helped out even more. But um, but yeah, this works out really well. So uh, my first in-person program potentially might be uh, the Flossmore Public Library sometime in the fall. I can't remember what the date is. Uh, but they said, yeah, we're going to possibly think maybe about having the program in person. I went, wow, <laughs> that'll be the first in-person program for a year and a half. Right. I'll probably cry. Um, and, and that will probably be an evening program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So our, you know, in the future, uh, we will, hopefully next year, we'll be able to start uh, in-person programming again but we will continue to offer virtual access. So in the future, maybe we'll be able to work something out where we'll uh, you know, link you in virtually. I think that would be possible. I'm pretty yeah. sure we could make that work, yeah. Because there's, I, I mean, the travel alone just makes it very inefficient. Yeah, um, yeah. no, it's, it, if we could do it virtually, that'd be great, I would love that. Besides, so. I can I actually have even more versatility than in doing something virtually, especially if I'm at home, because you go, oh, you want to see the meteorite from Mars? Sure, let me go grab it. It's on my table. You want to see the telescope close up? Yeah, let me show you that. So yeah, I can do I can do stuff like that. So that is so funny. <laughs> uh, okay, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Next week. 
Donna Washington is going to tell us all about Juneteenth. It's going to be great. Michelle, thank you so much. Thank I you. We wish you all the best professionally and personally. And uh, I, I hope for you that the Adler gets to reopen soon and that the next time we're together, we're, uh, you're talking to us from the Adler. Well, thank you. And, um, and I hope everyone else stays safe out there. Um, and whether we're together virtually, if the Adler's open, closed, whatever, we're at least, we're being very creative with what, with what we have to be able to interact with folks. Um, so if you're ever wondering what we're up to, just go to our website, um, www.adlerplanetarium.org. Uh, follow us on social media. You get the latest information that way and find out how you can interact with us online until we can be together in person safely. So that's that's the key through all this is keeping everyone as safe as possible. So we'll Absolutely. see where all this goes. Um, and uh, so I'll be with you one way or another. Uh, Absolutely, we would look forward to that. Take care everyone, have a great week. Michelle, thanks so much again. Take thanks. care. Bye. Bye.